Let's just get started, huh? Let's get started. Shelby Spear, a writer, a healer, an amazing mother. Thank you so much for coming on today. I think you're such an important guest to have on. You have so much wisdom to share to my generation, people who listen. And I think we're in a lot of pain right now as a society with anxiety and stress. And I can't wait to hear all your experiences, the things that you teach, the things that you're passionate about, because I really think in this conversation today, we really have the ability to help a lot of people. I hope so. It's, it's a privilege to be here. And thank you so much for wanting me to come in. And I admire what you do. I think you're having important conversations all the way around. And I think that's what we need more of is conversations mm, and yes. some deep listening to each other. Yeah. There's, there's very few moments today where we get a chance to sit with one another with no distractions. Right. No cell phones, no TV. Mm-hmm. You're not at a bar with the NFL game going on. It's just you and another person in a room. And it's beautiful what can happen and how much how much wisdom can be shared between the both of us. And I think there's such a space now where we need it. We really, really need these conversations. And we not only need those conversations, but we need the act of other people having conversations in their life too. Mm-hmm. Right. It allows truth to emerge. You know, if we give each other the time and the mm-hmm. space and the attentiveness yes. to really listen. Um, when I learned that silent and listen have the same letters. Wow. I never noticed that. See, already a little bit of wisdom right there. I love it. So I wanted to ask you about growth. So I believe a lot of what you're teaching is helping other people grow in their life. And as we both know, it's extremely uncomfortable to grow and get out of a place that you once were. So I would love to hear your journey of growth. Where did it start? Where are you currently? And what are some things that you've implemented along the way? Great question. Um, So that's all encompassing, right? I think we're all on a journey of Mm -hmm. growth uh, every moment. I'm never going to feel like I've arrived or I've reached some pinnacle or achieved the ultimate transformation or anything like that. I may have thought that like, oh, because it's such a goal oriented society. We need to perform and we need to achieve and we need to succeed and we need to, you know, reach that thing, whatever it is. And I've stepped back from that and realized it's not all of that. It's to, you know, growth is the journey. It's because as soon as we think we've figured it out then we've just put ourselves in a box because if I've figured it out now that's the standard and what happens when I don't meet the standard that I just set for myself because I achieved the goal Um, so going back to I guess my journey in a nutshell when did growth begin is one of the things you asked and I would say um, after I was married and we had children right away. My, I was 23 when I had my oldest son. So we were babies having babies. I was, are you 27? I'm 26. Yeah, I had three kids, you know. That's crazy. And by 27, I had three kids. And I started to realize there were parts about myself that I didn't understand, I didn't like, I wanted to change I wanted to be different and I was frustrated with how I was reacting to the world reacting to life but I didn't have any tools I didn't really understand what was going on but I knew I wasn't content with I wanted to be a better mom a better wife a better friend more patient less angry more this less that it was always something you know, so that was where the 
inkling or the the voice started really talking inside and it wasn't a nice voice I don't know if you can relate to that but like when you don't have an understanding of how the psyche works and how our inner world is set up you're just <laughs> trying to fly by the seat of your pants figuring out and plus you're raising kids you're you're working you're trying to be married it's overwhelming mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of like where I'm at now just kind of jump ahead for a second we need this conversation to understand that first of all everybody deals with that in life everyone deals with the inner voice the inner conflict the struggle the desire to be less or more so it's not unique um, but we don't talk about it and I think we're getting better yeah um, you know, we, we live in these bodies, but nobody tells us how they work, how our mind works, mm -hmm. how the miracle of this unbelievable, sophisticated technology of our body, no one tells us. And uh, when you don't know, what do you, you, what do, you do? So I didn't like the way things were going and I remember going to therapy at one point when I was young and it was, oh, you have postpartum, take this pill. That didn't solve any problems because the root of what was causing all of this wasn't even, dis like I still didn't know what the root was at the time and, and there was no conversation. Like, how are you feeling? Why, What's what are the thoughts that you're having? And it was more of a Band-Aid yeah. ap approach. So. Again, I think we can keep this through line about conversation and listening. We have to give space for ourselves to even listen to ourselves. <laughs> What's going on in here? Let alone talk to another person about it. Right. So things kind of escalated for me in that inner world of inner chaos, inner, you know, conflict I guess would be the best way to describe it and uh, when my kids were 11 9 and 7 I believe um, it was bad and I had a real dark night I had a moment uh, you know we could call it dark night of the soul I didn't want to be here anymore you know I thought when I say I <laughs> we can get into this a part of me thought not the true part of me, but a part of me thought that everyone would be better off if I wasn't here because I was so unhappy. And I had this beautiful life from the outside, beautiful kids, nice home. We have our needs met. We're involved in our church. We're doing all these things. We have a big circle of friends. What's the problem? Well, underneath, it was a tsunami inside me you know so the long and short of it is I I really I, I kind of joke I say I begged God to take me and um, I didn't get what I he took me but in a different way I say he it's not not gendered back then it was the way I was using the words but a higher power like just remove me from this planet because I'm done and I went into church the next day made it through the night and a friend of mine who was a deacon at that church said, take this, he pressed a business card in my hand. He said, this is a dear friend of mine, go see him. I've known him for 40 years, he's gonna help you. Cause I, I couldn't even explain, I was just in tears. Like, mm. I don't know. And he, and he was so intuitive, he just was caring and the love in him was like, this is what you need. So that started the growth, like getting in front of a talk therapist to try to sort out what in the world was going on. And I was diagnosed with um, bipolar back then. This was like 2007 or something like that. And so I went on medication. And, but over time, I had a lot of trauma in my childhood. And not that I really wanna get into it, but just the nutshell is I had sexual abuse and emotional abuse and some hard things. And everybody has a story. What 
that story of, of how it, the meaning I was assigning to what happened to me as a kid was setting up all kinds of beliefs I had about who I was, who I wasn't, you know, I didn't have, I didn't believe I had worth. I didn't believe that I had value. I felt powerless. I was super insecure. I was super needy because the idea of who am I was so distorted because of what had happened. And again, I had no tools. I had no understanding of just because that's the meaning I assigned doesn't mean it's true. You know, mm. that's what they, you know, I've learned from Gabor Mate, Dr. Gabor Mate about yeah. trauma. You know, it's, it's, yes, we are traumatized, but if we keep, we keep traumatizing ourselves every time we say that this, this, this defines me, this is the meaning I'm assigning, but we can change that. So that, let's just say the medicine I was on for 13 years was like a bridge for me to kind of um, be more even keeled. And it, it af afforded me the opportunity to dig deeper. And I, I would always honor my therapist uh, for the work that he did, but I started to do a lot on my own because I knew I needed more because there was still like, yes, I was on the medication, but I'm still believing some pretty bad stories and right. I'm still saying some pretty lousy things to myself. I still have negative self-talk. I'm still not content with how I'm navigating life. So something's not, this medicine isn't getting to that route. So I starting in t 2018, I went on a deep dive into all this healing stuff and energy and trying to understand the psyche and all the different aspects of ourselves and how the meaning we assign to things affects how we experience life and how everything's energy and we put negativity out there we're, we're resonating with negativity and we attract neg negativity and so it was really Joe Dispenza meditating with him in 2018 really got me to get quiet get that silent word you mm. know like wow okay I started to access some different parts of myself inside I started to experience altered states of consciousness just through meditation that pulled me so far back that I could look at what was happening as a, like an independent neutral observer and I was like whoa this is good because that's not really real this is all noise this is pattern this is programming this is conditioning that's just and I could start to see I I'm reacting because of this and then I could start to make sense of okay why am I triggered what's where's that coming from and it, I'm trying to summarize this as quickly as possible, but like, am I making sense at all about yeah. like how, so the growth was in here, how do I see myself in a new light? T to me, I think that's the essential um, starting point for anybody because if we don't know ourselves and we don't understand how we tick, why we tick, why we're triggered, and, 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 we're, and we don't understand that all of our emotions are good, everyone. The mm. anger, the jealousy, the hatred, the, all that sticky, crunchy stuff, it's, it's a signal for us that we're off, so that we're not aligned with our deepest self. And one of the quotes that I love to talk about, because you can just spiral all around it, is from the guy who runs Heart Math Institute. I don't know if you're familiar with that institute, but it's a phenomenal institution. It's been around for decades, and they do all these studies about heart-brain coherence and why it's so important to have the coherence between our feeling center and our brain. And his quote is, um, lack of alignment with our deepest self is the most unrecognized stress on earth. Mm. And when I read that, I was like, that feels so true to me. And I, I like to substitute the word stress with fear. We're afraid because we don't know who we are. And, or we're afraid because we do know who we are. <laughs> and 
sometimes I think Marianne Williamson has a quote that we're, we're afraid more of our power than we are of our weakness. And I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, so we have to figure out who are we? No, not, not who other people say we are, not who society says we are, not what this voice in our he- head is saying who we are. What is the true person, the true essence? Mm. And this, these last, what is it, 20, 23, these last five years then have been know thyself, Shelby. You know, mm. who are you, really? And, and knowing that I finally, at 53 years old, love myself, truly, all of it. Yeah. The good and the bad. Wow. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for just sharing all of that. Extremely yeah. powerful and it's cool to hear how much you've gone through to get to this point. And I think it helps put things in perspective for even just myself, someone who is still at 26 years old and who is getting those feelings of anxiety and questioning why I do the things I do and what are my thought patterns? What, how, how much trauma did I have growing up and how has that affected me? And to hear how much work you've had to go through and how much pain is associated with that. It helps me understand that I'm not alone, number one. And then two, that this is a never ending work in progress Mm -hmm. that I'm not. And I think you mentioned this earlier is there's never going to be that end goal, that perfect person of I have no anxiety and I feel great all the time. Like you said, it's it's important to have those feelings. Mm-hmm. Those those feelings are a part of who you are. Mm-hmm. And there's so much to unpack in, in what you said, and I think we'll get to that. But the, the one thing I really wanted to touch on first is the multiple parts of yourself and the different parts of your psyche. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that we have, you know, you were going through a tough time, and we have that dark part of ourselves that may be saying something that, maybe isn't in alignment with our essence and it kind of, you feel that clashing, you feel, um, I was going to say negative thoughts, but you said, you know, everything's good, but those, those feelings of uneasiness, of anxiety and stress, how do you manage all those different parts of yourself and how do you continue to have a good relationship with those different parts as well? Mm -hmm. So this is just all from, reading from a lot of very wise people and studying and applying what I've learned in my own life. So I I can only speak from my own direct experience. And what I did in this, I don't even remember where, who, maybe that Dr. Nicole LaPera, she's a holistic psychologist on Instagram. She may have been the first person that talked about naming your different aspects definitely naming your ego. And so um, I named my ego and I named my shadow and my true self would be Shelby. So, and I, before I get into that, let me just say, I think it's so important that we have, um, that we, it's not about killing off any of these parts. Like they're, they're all part of us. It's like finding that inner oneness so we can experience oneness outside of us because if we don't love inside we don't forgive ourselves we don't see worth in ourselves how can we really see that because everything is a mirror outside of us reflecting an aspect of who we are back to us when I learned that I really did it's like taking responsibility for your inner world Um, there's a Jesus said something in the Bible about when you get your inside, you you are blessed when you get your inside world, your heart and mind put right. And I took that to heart because I knew my heart and mind weren't right. (laughs) So the, the, the real simple way that I've learned to understand at least ego, shadow, and, you know, your true self, your soul, whatever. And there's other aspects in all this, but your ego is really a program it's not even real it's like an operating system that's developed so your psyche splits when you're growing up 
everything that's uh, affirmed and people tell you that's good, um, you know, they, they encourage whatever, that becomes your ego. So you're externally basing your worth based on how people communicate to you. You know, we, you know if you're singing and your, your, your parents, oh, you know, that sounds great. Oh, good. I, I should keep singing, you know. So I am a singer. So you say, hey, I am, whatever is after that, that becomes part of your ego. But it's not, necess- it's not real because it's just based on how the outside world interacts with you. The shadow is the parts that aren't affirmed, are rejected by others, or, you know, are told, like, let go back to the singing, you shouldn't sing, that you don't have a good voice. So then you just shove that part of yourself down. Or you shouldn't be angry, you shouldn't do, you know, it's not good to do that. And it's not just your parents, it's society, it's your religion, it's culture, whatever. And so you start to deny aspects of who you are good and bad so maybe you're positive like the things you really excuse me the things you really want to do in life um, you won't pursue them because you've been told or you believe for some reason they're not you're not worthy of it that's part of your shadow and then the stuff that people reject but you don't see that other people see it in you more than you do and your ego's job is to defend it at all costs this is from a lot of the work of um, Debbie Ford. She's back in the 90s. The Dark Side of the Light Chasers, Chasers is one of the first books I read about this. Of course, <laughs> I read it in the 90s, but it clearly didn't register because none of it <laughs> like made any sense to me. Um, so, if, but then your true self is like your essence. It's the love you're made of. I mean, it's, it's good. But what I learned about the shadow is it's really also part of your soul that's just lost. It's, it's in the dark. It's hidden. You've shoved it so far down. But it's always coming up and interfering, on, like, to serve you. So if you have feelings of rejection or feelings of, you know, if you're insecure, if you feel not enough, all these things, it's your shadow. The ego has to protect that. And so it projects that on other people. Mm. So I may point out, I'm not pointing you out, but like, you know, Trevor's, he's so insecure. That's, that's pure projection. I'm insecure. I don't necessarily even know how insecure I am because if it's so buried deep in my shadow, but it's got to be integrated and it's got to be recognized. So I'll keep projecting it out. So that's when I started to pay attention, like, oh, I can find my shadow real fast. Every time I have a negative kind of, you know, feeling that's, um, it's just not in alignment, but it's not the other person. Where is this? Why? And you start to ask, why am I feeling this? What's the story behind it? And is this story true? Mm -hmm. Do I need to believe this? is is it serving me there's a, there's byron katie the work i have she's another one i would love to shout out because it, she has this practice called the work and it's four questions it's basically is this true can i know for 100 percent certainty that this is true whatever i'm believing and how do i behave when i believe it's true and then who would i be if i didn't believe it and i started to do that every time these typical rejection, insecurity, neediness types of things would come up. Like, what's the story around this? And one by one, I started dismantling the stories. But it was all in love and equanimity inside. Like, don't judge myself for feeling that because I didn't even know it was so unconsciously formed, these Mm. beliefs and these stories. It's kind of like a survival mechanism, especially if you have trauma as a child. You you don't have the cognitive ability to process those things. So it's part of our makeup that we've got this ability to split our mind and push these things aside until we are ready and able to work with them. So I kept saying, you know, I, I got to have this oneness. I got to love all these parts. And you start to say, okay, so Roxanne is my ego she's spicy 
<laughs> and Michelle is my shadow because that was my middle name. So it's like, Michelle, I see that you're feeling left out. You're feeling abandoned. You're feeling whatever. What's going on? It's like having this, literally have a conversation with this aspect. Mm. What, what do you need? How can I help you? You know, like, and, and your body answers, like, go for a walk, <laughs> go breathe, go, go do something fun, you know? So this is the process, like you start to befriend instead of hate, literally hate, I like hated parts of myself because yeah. I'm like, I, I shouldn't be this way. It's like, well, every human has these emotions. They're not unique to me. And if we say that we don't, we're probably lying <laughs> because we want to put, that's what the ego does. It puts masks on. I mean, how many different personas do we have when we're trying to fit in, in a group, in a certain setting, in our family? We go home and maybe it's not great. So you put the mask on, pretend like everything's fine. We don't have to do that all the time. We can just be okay. If I don't, if I'm upset with someone, it's okay. But instead of, so, so the ego's thing is the blame. That's the name of the game. So I always know I'm an ego if, if someone else is guilty or if I'm making myself guilty. I know that's my ego. And mm -hmm. I learned that from a guy named Aaron Apke. It's a simple, oh, there's guilt here. There's Roxanne. Hey, Roxanne. <laughs> We're going to try to look at this a different way, <laughs> you know. It kind of it makes you laugh because mm -hmm. you need levity. Because it's not easy. We talked a little bit on the phone about, like, this work is not, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go on this self-transformation path and it's going to be all roses and rainbows and it's gonna, I'm not going to experience nothing but light. Mm. No. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> What's, yeah, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's great. Uh, it's the ups and downs, right? And, and I've heard this word be thrown around a lot, toxic positivity, mm -hmm. where we will just look at the positive aspects of life or if there is something going on where you are feeling those emotions of guilt, fear, whatever it is, you block it out. And that's not me. I'm, I'm not like that. That's not me. And you're just trying to stay positive throughout, which it has good intentions behind it. Mm -hmm. But I think you said it earlier with the shadow, you're trying to just push it down, push it down, push it down. And I, I think when we continue to push that down, we get in those bouts of depression or bouts of just feeling like we're not ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's we're just in constant conflict internally. And it's it's so hard to not be that way because society tells us we shouldn't be depressed or we shouldn't be sad. Don't don't cry, especially as a man. You know, don't don't cry or show emotions. That's not how you're supposed to live your life. You need to be strong all the time. But what's what's the end goal here? You know, I, I want to feel at peace. I want to feel fulfilled in my life and the things that I do. And sometimes I need to cry if something's sad, mm -hmm. you know, and embracing those emotions. And a lot of what I just took away from what you said is when you get that trigger of judgment, check yourself immediately mm -hmm. and have that conversation with either the ego or the shadow and try to understand where that judgment is coming from and then also having having enough grace I guess you could say to say that's okay mm -hmm. if I am judging this person that's mm -hmm. that's okay this is part of who I am let's unpack this a little bit and let's try to see how I can move forward from this and then not act on that. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important too. And we talked about this on the phone. Knowledge is one thing and self-awareness is one thing. It's the first step, but how do we act and move forward from there? That's what really matters. And that's what I think can reverberate change, not only in your life, but in, in other people's lives as well. For sure. For sure. Because yeah. we have to put it into practice and, and like the the grace, I always talk about gobs of grace. You've got to swallow down gobs of grace. Like it's your job because it's, it's, we, we were so unconscious when these, these habits formed, these patterns formed. It's almost like when we're kids, imagine that 
you've got a little USB drive and it's like, it just, it's all downloaded in and we aren't aware. So we become aware. And when we start paying attention and noticing without judgment of, of ourselves, of our behaviors, you just like Ram Das always says, when these emotions come, it's like, ah, there's anger. Mm. I see you. Mm. I see you. I don't want you. I'm not mad. I'm not, I'm not mad at my mad. <laughs> I just, I accept. I allow. But when we pause it, and take that breath, like you said, you, the judgment comes in, let's check. Then I can choose my response. So I'm not going to dump it out on the person. Right. You know, because that's where the maturity and the, under, you know, the, the growth comes in because it's, we realize that, you know, in the past when we weren't aware, we're just unconsciously reacting and we will, you know, the shadow Debbie Ford used to describe, if you take a, a, a blown up ball and you push it under the water, how much force do you have to exert to keep that thing under the water? Like a lot. And that's what we're doing. I don't want anyone to know this about me. I don't want anybody to see this side of me. I don't even want to see it. I want to shove it down, shove it down. That's life force energy that we could be using to live our dreams, to pursue, to, or not, I don't like that word pursue, but to just <laughs> do the things we really want to do. But, you know, you hold that down long enough and they, one of the terms that Eckhart Tolle talks about is that thing becomes a pain body then. It's like a whole another entity that's really not happy. And the minute you take your eye off that, it flies up. And you see this and you always wonder like, wow, that person just went off the deep end. Yeah. Well, that's what happened. Yeah. They weren't themselves. They were pretending. They were hiding all this stuff. And I have so much compassion for, for those situations because it's like, We've all been there, if we're honest. We can all say, I've done that. I've done that. Maybe not to that extreme, but if I keep doing holding this ball down, that's going to be me. Yeah. And then is everyone going to judge me and say, because then, then everyone's egos and shadows come out. Oh, look at, you know, look at that jerk. Look at that person. They didn't, you know, they're just projecting. Yeah. Yeah. I had this quote by Carl. So when I was doing research for this podcast with you, I found this quote by Carl Jung and I knew we were going to get into this topic of shadow and mm -hmm. enlighten everything. So I want to read this. There is no light without shadow and no psychic wholeness without imperfection. To round itself out, life calls not, per per not for perfection, but for completeness. Mm -hmm. And for this, the thorn in the flesh is needed. The suffering of defects without which there is no progress and no ascent. Yeah. And I think that's so important to remember when we are in those tough times. And I always try to tell my clients that I work with who are going through weight loss journeys or if maybe it's a weight gain journey, you know, trying to gain muscle or preparing for a sporting event, whatever it is. And they go through a hardship and they go through some type of hurdle or obstacle it's it's an opportunity to prove to yourself who you are. It's an opportunity to become better and to grow from this. So not necessarily looking at it as, oh my gosh, this is so terrible. I can't believe I have this darkness about me or, you know, I, I always binge eat or I always do this or, you know, I hurt myself doing this. Wow, what a great opportunity for you to continue to learn yourself more. Mm -hmm. And to continue moving forward and continue to progress because that's that's where I personally I think fulfillment comes from that progression and that walking towards perfection even though we'll never obtain it but that just constant progress that constant figuring things out and just trying to understand yourself a little bit more it's so much fun you know I say it's fun because there there isn't a lot of uh I, let me rephrase this so I think it's fun to go through hard things because I, of the outcome. Mm -hmm. But during that time, it, might not be it sucks. <laughs> it's not necessarily fun. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's just important, I think, to go through those things and and to understand that it's just a part of life. And 
as much as you want to get rid of the discomfort, it's needed. Yeah. It's so needed. It's your in friend. Life. I mean, it's it's a signal. It's a helper. Like our our emotions are a guidance system. Mm. It's like we should be so grateful because it's like they're saying something's off kilter here. You're not aligned with your truth, or things are good. Yeah. You know, um, and the hard stuff. Like, and it's like if I, I'd rather go through the hard thing so I can realize I've got some stories that are running in the background that are not serving me. And if I didn't have the hard thing to force me to look at, they're still there. You know, yeah. so the, the dark is important. It's, you know, it, it, it's where the growth comes from, I feel, the most. I mean, we could everything could be smooth sailing but are we going to become more are we going to understand more if it's just or are we just going to get in that pattern like the smooth sailing pattern and a lot of things can be better you know yeah yeah and i think we see that a lot today especially in my generation where we have social media you have that comparison trap you you constantly feel like you need to get rid of all the bad things that are happening in your life, whether that's financial, emotional, people in your life, other things that are happening. You're just trying to get rid of the discomfort. I need to get rid of this and get rid of that mm -hmm. instead of just embracing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, I, I think you have a farm on your land, right? It's not animals, but yeah. It's yeah. Farmland. yeah. Yeah. It's farmland. Uh -huh. That's not easy work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good analogy for life and how much work we have to put into it to reap the benefits. You know, you can't just plant a seed and then do nothing. And all of a sudden exactly. you, you have all this amazing harvest and all this food. You know, you have to take care of it. You have to fight off insects, fight off, you know, create something around the deer so they don't eat the, the plant. There's so much you have to do to battle adversity and to actually reap those benefits of all the work that you put in, in the beginning I, I like what you said there and it reminds me well, we do have a garden and one of the th ways that I like to talk about shadow work because shadow work is like you know a practice that's kind of the lingo it's, you know to work on your shadow but it sounds daunting sometimes but I when you think about it these aspects of yourself are light that are hidden in the dark so they're like under the soil. So I call it electric gardening. Mm. <laughs> when, I when, when I release, when I nurture that soil and I work with it and I prepare it so that seed has the proper nutrients and everything to emerge and become what it was in patterned to be. It's if, if I'm releasing more of myself, it's more light. It's more of my light that's been in the dark. So it's like a privilege, I feel like, mm. not a, you know, a, a mundane task or a, you know, this struggle. We have to be careful with the words we use because every word carries a frequency. And when we say things, we, we all do it out of habit. Oh, this it was a nightmare. This was so, you know, horrible. I, I almost died. You know, like, those things. Those carry a really <laughs> significant charge. So it's like I'm always trying to flip things into a better context of just it's spelling the the name spelling. I, I think that was on purpose because we're casting a spell with the mm. word, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Language is so impactful for it how is. we think. Think of how like if you heard something, if somebody said something to you at, at a point in your past, sometimes we hold on to a word. That someone, maybe their intention was totally different, yeah. but the way we received it, that the energy of that word, now it's just, it spins in place inside us until we release yeah. it. And how many times have, at least for me personally, where I've said something and after I was like, what did I just say? Or when yeah. someone says, uh, you know, you're going into the gym, have a nice workout. Yeah, you too. And they're working the front desk. They're obviously not working out. You know, right, one of those right, moments right, right, like, right. what did I just say? Yeah. It's habit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so think of those times when someone might have said something to you that you took personally and it really hurt you. 
and try to look in, into yourself like why am I feeling this way is it internal or is it truly they had the intention of hurting me because I, I I bet 99% of the time that was never their intention right it, and who knows where it's coming from out of that yeah because exactly. we're all dealing with all this stuff inside yeah so it's like so much grace and compassion for others too mm. when you start to see it in yourself it's like listen everybody's do, dealing with it yeah give everybody a break yeah because again they're mirroring you give them a break you're giving you a break you know it's we're all connected here yeah so. i think the empathy grows when you start yeah. to work on self-development mm -hmm. i want to get into the shadow work that you do do what does that entail is it journaling is it meditation a little bit of both is there anything else that you might throw in the mix yeah all of that um but one of the things i mentioned is when we were talking is my meditation practice has evolved to really it's not a sitting quietly somewhere for a certain amount of time anymore it's just become part of my existence where i am constantly to the best of my ability, being aware of being aware, of noticing how my body's, so feelings would be in your body. What's, how's my body feeling in this moment? What emotions are happening? What's the story I'm telling? And so I'm almost doing that Byron Katie work throughout my day. If I get snagged, if something bumps or triggers or whatever, because I think I just read a quote somewhere triggering is a service being triggered is a choice and i was like wow that's wise because it is a service to be for someone to do something that maybe ruffles your feathers because it alerts you that you've got something inside that's not healed that mm. needs a new perspective but it's my choice if i'm going to be in a bad mood the rest of the day and I'm going to be triggered, you know, and I'm going to yeah. be mad at that. I'm going to blame my ego is going to be like, it's your fault. You made me feel this way. And I know my kids laugh sometimes because it's like, geez, mom, you know, I don't really remember you having all that um, knowledge when, we, when you were raising <laughs> us as kids. And I did not. I did not. You know, mm. so but the the journaling, um, the just the kind of all day meditative state of mind and a lot of times I will sit and do kind of a little meditative journey and kind of maybe do a healing. There's, have you ever heard of the Ho'oponopono practice? It's a Hawaiian, I guess you could call it a prayer of some kind, but it's four statements. It's, um, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. That's it. And you can use that with your shadow with your ego with your with whoever if it, you know um for the other person they don't even have to know um it's a way of just offering that grace and being okay with all of it and just you know i'm sorry please forgive me i didn't mean to be i didn't mean to shove you that part of me down or i didn't mean to hurt that other person you know keeps you it just keeps it real and it also keeps you focused on let's you know, uh, together we rise, together we fall, inside and out. Mm. So it's like stay, stay in that oneness. Just this, we're all we're all on the same team. Yes, we're all on the same team, inside and out. If we really could grasp that, we wouldn't feel so alone. We wouldn't feel so desperate. We wouldn't feel so confused. If we could tap into this collective wholeness that really does exist. If we allow ourselves enough silence and time to embrace it, it's comforting. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said there um, about that practice of almost forgiving yourself mm -hmm. and then saying, hey, I, I love you. And, you know, for me, I knew I needed to heal from certain things and I needed to address certain things that were causing anxiety and the first aspect is that self-awareness that we talked about, right? Understanding that I need to heal from something. Okay, now how do I do that? Mm -hmm. It's, it is a daunting task. And, mm -hmm. 
you don't really know where to go. And sometimes you feel like you're making progress. And then other times you feel like you're going right back to your old ways. And, you know, how, how do you deal with something like that? Do you continue to just practice your mantras or, you know, do you reach out to community? I guess from your experience, what has helped you? Well, I think that there's no right answer. I will always say that. And you did mention at the beginning that I was a healer. And I would like to say that I don't believe that I am because I think that everyone is their own healer. Mm. So I, a guide, sure. An encourager, an advocate, yes. But I do believe that we all have the superpower, not just the power, but the superpower to heal, transform, and remember who we are. So with what, you know, what do you do when we're, you're struggling with, but if we're using anxiety as the example and, and what's the good practices, I think we really need to trust our bodies that are always speaking to us to tell us what we need. What does Trevor need? What does Shelby need? Um, I saw a sign driving in Menor last year on some business that said, treat your body like you live in it. And I was like, I, I need to have a tattoo of that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, wow, treat your body like you live in it. How novel <laughs> and how obvious. <laughs> right, right, right. It's yeah. like, do I? And we're so outsourced and not in tune because of the distractions, which we've talked about. Social media has definitely added to that more outsourced. Like our consciousness is hardly ever in this body. It's in the email. It's in the text. It's in the podcast. It's in the, you know, it's, it's in the conversation we had four hours ago that we're still ruminating over. We're so, we're in so many places, which is, amazing that we can do that but we're not here we're not home so for me speaking from experience that anxiety would be worse when I was split into a million pieces parts mm. consciously because where do I have any energy to deal with if I have a you know a script that won't stop running I'm you know I had an argument and I'm repeating it a thousand times in my head thinking that somehow I'm going to fix the thing that already happened. <laughs> it's not going to change because that, that thing already happened. And when we put our body through that script, our body doesn't know the difference if it's happening in real time or if it was two hours ago and it's reacting and responding and all the chemicals and all the stress and hormones are going on as if it's right now. Mm. But again, we have more bandwidth if we, I think that t anybody benefits from taking a pause and doing deep breathing. Our breath is our, is our lifeblood. And how often do we even pay attention to how we're breathing? Because I found, you know, going back to this deep dive that started in 2018, I had so many things go wrong physically from the stress that I was under. I started to get food allergies to everything. I never had any. I had gallstones. I had ulcers. I, I, I mean, my body was like screaming for my attention. And when I finally realized, oh, I need to start listening. My body is saying, hey, by the time we have a physical symptom, it's already gone through so many layers of energetic auras, this field around us, to get to the physical. Mm -hmm that to me it's at that's the big wake up it's like okay um i tried to get you out here and then i tried to get you here you didn't listen you didn't listen and now boom so i learned to take that very seriously to be in be present in my body is my breath shallow am i am i even breathing because yeah. <laughs> i'm i know it's like when you're stressed we're like taking these little teeny breaths and that 
ex is exhausting. So then again, more bandwidth depleted because we're not breathing well. Maybe we're not drinking enough because we're not even thinking about hydrating because we're so caught up in the mental trap. So I think our body is the best gauge. It's our subconscious. It's constantly sending the, the emotion. It's, it's, you're feeling it physically. Um, you're getting that intuition somehow. It's not a spoken word, but you, it's like, you know, but you can't hear any of those signals if you're not there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Oh my God. That's so powerful. And it's something I've been so close to with my personal training practice so um, I've been super into the field of mobility training and learning how to just move better overall and the number one thing I do before any workout now and what I have all my clients do is just an assessment head to toe mm -hmm. on each of our joint articulations and saying how am I feeling? Am I feeling tight in this area? And then addressing that. And that first part of that awareness and just taking time to be conscious of how my body is moving can dictate how great of a workout or how bad of a workout you're going to right. have. Right. But it also structures what you can do for your body. Right. And it, it makes such a difference. And I, I come from athletics. I know um, your daughter does as well. I'm not sure. I, I was an athlete. Yeah. So you were an athlete, of course. That feeling of like, I need to push myself. I need to keep going. I, you know, kind of putting down your your pain and right. fatigue and pushing through it. It is important in sports and don't get me wrong. But as we get into the real world, we take those habits with us. Mm -hmm. And it leads to degeneration of right. our joints of our tissues of how we feel we feel fatigued and tired all the time we never get enough rest because we're constantly pushing 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 for more and with this practice of mobility I've started to recognize all the times that I did push too hard or all the times when maybe I go into the gym and I can take a day to just work on light movements or just work on some stretching and some light isometrics to help my body move better and heal, facilitate healing. Because we always are trying to go into the gym and break our bodies down. And I think it, it has a lot of crossover to our mental health as well, Absolutely. where we're trying to beat ourselves into submission of positivity or stop thinking these negative thoughts instead of just accepting, okay, I'm a little sore today. Yeah, my, my shoulder is really bugging me today. Maybe I slept on it wrong. Mm -hmm. Or maybe my neck is extremely stiff because I've been holding in stress yeah. all day. Mm -hmm. And you can address that. And once you're aware, now I can address it. Now I can go, okay, this is where I'm at. Let's move forward with that. Let's With that information, how do I move forward? And uh, no, I just love that you brought up the whole body piece because it's something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And uh, something I love to just you know research and, and understand a little bit more of yeah and are you familiar with qigong no uh, it's a movement breathing kind of practice um and the, the slogan for their kind of you know pr modality is no pain no pain and when I heard that I was like oh, I like that because it's not that yes I understand we you know, you, you know that you had a good workout because you got pain. But but if we feel that that's the only way <laughs> to have a good something is if we have the pain and we need to push through the pain and we need to, why does it have to be that way? It's just like questioning these beliefs that we have. And going back to what you said about doing this assessment, and there's a thing called yoga nidra where you kind of scan your whole body in a meditative state. Um, so much of that tightness in the shoulder, which may be the stress or anything, there's always an emotional aspect associated to that physical tension or strain or whatever. It's both and. And there's, I've really gone deep into this to see, there, the Chinese have, it's all like the meridian points and everything in the body. Each of our organs, all of the different areas have specific emotions like our lungs is grief and, and that kind of makes sense if you just kind of logically look at it right. we don't breathe well when we're in grief or 
closed up. Mm -hmm. So that affects the breathing. Um, Knees is like inflexibility, not able to move forward in life. If you've got, because I have a a kind of a knee thing going. And um, there's a book called Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. And it literally shows you how when we when these emotions become trapped inside us and we don't acknowledge we're not even aware maybe but then we if we are we just don't want to deal with it we don't acknowledge that they manifest into these physical and that's really becoming more mainstream now even the cleveland clinic is talking about chakras and stuff i was like whoa we're we're moving finally moving forward (laughs) so it's like treat the whole body like you live in it mind body spirit all yes. of it the whole thing it, it, it because it's it's a whole complex unit it's not separate parts again yeah. going back to the oneness it's all of it and we can we have all these tools we have all these practices and people and teachers that are so beautiful such beautiful people out there that really want to help and they they do help and it takes a lot of courage, I think, to go down that path because, as you said at the beginning, you know, crossing that threshold into the unknown, into those areas that don't feel great, and, we, and we're comfortable. Even if we're, like, angry, bitter, dealing with unforgiveness, at least it's comfortable because we know this is, who, this is how I operate. Ooh, what's it going to be like if I have to actually face that head on? Yeah. But, man, when you get to the other side. It is freedom. It's freedom. Yeah, yeah. You're open to learning more and figuring out how to move better, how to feel better, how to think better. Yeah. There's so much information out there. It's funny. I I talk to my mom about this all the time is the more I learn about either mobility or mental health, whatever, I feel like the less I know because the the more, the deeper I can get into it. And it's just, it's crazy how much we can learn about ourselves if we recognize that we don't know it all and that we have so much room for growth that's almost never ending. Yeah. And that's the definition of humility because it's you realize that the more you know, you don't know anything. We know such a fraction of an infinite fraction of reality and the, but if you don't push yourself to, to learn these things you may think you've got it all figured out but when you realize that you don't you automatically have more compassion you automatically have more grace you automatically have more empathy because it's like how could I know like I don't have any idea yeah. <laughs> like even the stuff I'm sharing today I, I don't know what's true you could interview me in six months and I I may have a different perspective. Yeah. There's 8 billion people. There's 8 billion perspectives. Who's right? You got to trust your experience. Mm, the intuition. Um, I, so we are talking about what's right. or kind of having that perspective of what's right. So I recently just got married in May. Which your your daughter actually played at. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was it was a beautiful ceremony, and you know I, I love Carly to death. She's she's the best. And before we even got married, we had that understanding of there is no I'm right or you're right. It's how can we come to a common ground and just be a team. Like you mentioned earlier, is having that completeness and that wholeness. And I would love to hear from your perspective. Obviously, you know, you went through a really tough time when you first started having kids and you first got married. How did you and your husband maybe turn that around or or were there some things that you worked on to have a better marriage moving forward? Yeah. So even though, thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Even though we were both, especially me, struggling and not really understanding who we were or how all of this works and understanding our psyche and everything uh, we did take steps because at the five-year mark um, we were struggling bad because we had so many life events at once you know married three kids boom 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 three and a half years I changed I, I left my career he changed jobs he was working like crazy we moved twice both of our parents got divorced in the first five years of our marriage wow. And we were like, 
what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and and when you don't have the self awareness, which obviously you do, which I admire so much, and we didn't have that at that age, so life was just coming at us really fast. <laughs> we didn't know what we, we didn't know how to process all the things individually. We didn't know how to process them together, let alone even have the understanding of how the other person, because we were kind of in the mindset of, you complete me. I think that movie was a real downer for people that was, uh, what's that Tom Cruise movie? With that, That's a famous line where he says, you complete me. Um, <sighs> I'm drawing a blank, but it doesn't matter. It wasn't Top Gun or anything like that. No. no. But anyway, Jerry Maguire. Ah. It's not a good line because if you go into a partnership thinking that the other person fills the hole, it's, it's not going to ever really work that way because mm. it's, it's the whole person coming together with the whole person and helping each other, you know, being mirroring that for each other and helping each other evolve. So we, um, we went on a marriage encounter weekend at five-year mark, which saved everything. We spent three days with other couples, listening to other couples share their this yeah. conversation, having, yeah. you know, like listening, like if the Me Too, oh, you guys are, so it's not just us, like this is like a thing in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, it we actually thought about leaving the first night we went down to the bar and had a beer and we were like, this is dumb. This is not, we were both just not feeling it. Mm. But man, when we got to the end, we had to do an exercise. And I bring this up because I think it's a fabulous tool for any, I don't care if it's a family member, family member or marriage or whatever relationship, but it was called 90-90. And we had to separate for 90 minutes and write how we were feeling. And then we had to come back together for 90 minutes. And I had to, my husband's name is John. I had to read to John my letter and he could not interrupt. He had to listen to all of it. And then he could respond. And then I had to listen to him read his. I mean, it was the first time that we really got to express how we were feeling with all of these life changes we had been through. It was revolutionary because... We saw each other. I see you. <laughs> I finally hear you. I, I, you know, and 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 that was like the building block. So then, for the next ten years, we started this circle group where it was like ten couples every month. We got together and we rotated homes, and we just had real, raw, vulnerable conversations. Whoever hosted it would share a little bit. I mean, you have to have, feel pretty safe. You have to you know, feel comfortable with the people, people yeah. but it was powerful because we didn't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And even though we may not have had the self-awareness awareness and the emotional intelligence, probably more so th than we realized, but like being in that group setting and helping each other and supporting each other and encouraging each other, I, I, I mean, it, it, was, it was incredibly beneficial for us so and then we did a lot of other marriage ministry stuff after that so that that really made a difference and I think it's okay to say you're struggling yeah yeah it's hard work right mm -hmm. yeah that's what everyone told me is yeah marriage is hard work marriage it is. is hard work, hard yeah, work. well good thing I'm not afraid of a little hard work yeah. um yeah I, I I love that you said that and I think it highlights a lot of number one listening to your partner and understanding what their needs are too. And you, you brought up a really good point of not having that mentality of this person completes me because mm -hmm. then you're relying on somebody else for your own fulfillment and purpose. Mm -hmm. And that should be done internally. You should do that Absolutely. internal work. And although that person can help you in that process, they shouldn't be the person you rely on for it. Right. And uh, I think that's, you know, even diving deeper into that, having someone that accepts that and then also gives you the time of day to help you work on whatever you're working on. Mm -hmm. 
that is so, so important. And uh, one of the defining moments for why I married Carly is, so I, I decided to stop playing football. I ended up tearing my Achilles, tried to come back for another year, hurt it again, went through a week of mental turmoil of, should I keep going, all this? And I finally decided I need to hang it up. And it was it was tough. You know, you spend 10 years or so playing this game almost every single day. You're training for it. You're thinking about it. And now it's just gone. And now the rest of your life is ahead of you. And it's scary. And I remember that whole process happened in the day of. She was going to school down in Bowling Green. Drove all the way up two and a half hours just to be with me for the night. And it wasn't like she was trying to give me advice or saying all these things of you need to stay positive or you need to stay strong. It was just, I'm here. I know you're hurting. I know you're sad, but I'm here for you in this moment. Let's break bread together and, you know, I'll, I'll be here to comfort you. And, and I just always remember that moment because it would have been so much easier for her to stay down there and mm-hmm. shoot me a couple of texts of yeah. love you, you know, hope right. you're doing well. Right. But she knew that po- the power of presence right. and the power of just having someone to go through the hard stuff with is uh, it's really comforting. Mm-hmm. And and to have somebody that you truly do love in those moments and someone that you connect on on so many levels, it, it does make it so much easier and uh, it helps you process emotions much better. So. That, yeah, that absolutely. It's beautiful. I, I, I'm blessed to say I have a, a, a partner who is like that. And we've, it's like we've shared many times when I've been down, he's lifted me up. When, when he's been down, I've lifted. It just seems to always have worked that we've neither, both of us haven't been in this low place at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but we would have figured it out. But I mean, it is, I don't take that lightly to have someone who, I went through a lot. I mean, and he went through a lot too, but like he stood by me and provided that safe space for me to, to find myself again and to become the true me. And I don't know how you can put a price tag on something like that because not everybody gets, but again, I'm saying like, even if you don't, even if you're not, you don't have someone like that yet, or you don't feel there's somebody out there and plus you have it within you. You really, truly do if you can start to listen to what's going on in there and start questioning these beliefs. Because I don't want people to feel like if I don't have a partner, I can't, I won't be able to heal. I won't have that support. I think you can. Oh, yeah. For sure. You know. Yeah. And I always tell my, my single friends this, say they go through a breakup or whatever. Work on yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Number one, take care of yourself. Figure out what you love to do. Figure out what what makes you passionate, what really brings that fire in your belly. Mm -hmm. And also don't chase attract, Mm -hmm. let, let the relationship cultivate naturally. Let, I, I, I really do believe this and you know, people can have their opinions on it, but I, I think universe, God, whatever you want to phrase it as put people into your life for specific reasons. And they've always come in at these, opportune moments in my life where I've really been down or I feel lost or I I need to go a little bit further in spirituality, whatever it is. These people are just strategically placed into my life Mm -hmm. and they provide so much wisdom, so much support. And I think only because I'm open-minded and open to receiving that, I can reap those benefits of what that person has to offer. And not to say, you know, people are only around to to offer me things, but having that openness allows you to receive who that person is and allows you to implement it into your own life. 100% beautifully said. And when I flip the switch to life happens for me, it doesn't happen to me. That was a huge game changer. And so I was in the victim mindset for the majority of my life. All these things happened to me, therefore I can't this or I'm not that or whatever. But when I looked back even 
and I've changed uh, my favorite influence person all these years is Wayne Dyer and he said when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change and that just that that small shift that life happens for me opened up so many doors and so I can look at the people that come into my life and really like okay they showed up there this this person's here now this is for me what are they mirroring what what is it that I what's the reflection of me that I need to see you know how, how instead of just being so casual and not really just be almost being unconscious of of the people that come into your life even if it's a five-minute conversation at mm. CVS with a stranger you resonated and came together for a reason and it's kind of fun you know it's 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 makes like very curious like wow what what is the lesson where what is there to learn today where where can I grow what's something new that I what I wasn't looking for and it takes the pressure off of this constant stride thinking this belief that we have to make everything happen that we have to work so hard and strive and achieve and compete and grind but when you take a step back and it's like no the universe is like serving you it's happening for you be more awake be have your eyes wider yeah <laughs> and your heart more open and then those synchronicities start happening and they just don't stop and then it gets super fun because it's like, wow, I could have, that's just a needle in a haystack. I could have never found this book or met this person or had this opportunity. It's just, that's when you know you're in the flow. You're in, you're going downstream instead of fighting the current mm. the other way, you know. Mm. That's just been my experience, and there's a lot of great teachers who talk about this stuff. Mm. Is there anything that you do to a lot um, it sounds like it's really just breath work and meditation and just being more aware. But I guess is there was there a turning point where you started to recognize those things in your life? Yeah, I mean, those few things that you listed is on the short list of the gazillions of practices yeah. I've done. You know, there's so many and I don't stick with I, I, I try not to get in these habits because again, the more patterns we create, then we're not then we're just turning the consciousness off and we're just letting the thing that the habit and the pattern take us and I one of the things I did for a while was I created um, instead of just a to-do list I wrote on the next column a to-be list because I may not get the 10 items done but I'm more c concerned of who I am do I you know I want to be patient and kind and loving and considerate and if I can check those off to the best of my ability I don't care if I got the 10 things done so um, you know I've got three tattoos and all of them I've embodied the messages this is be love in Karn's handwriting and this is embrace stillness and I've truly like made that s the state of being more important than the doing Mm -hmm. because we're not called human doings you've probably heard that before I mean, yeah. we're human beings and I want to be love I want to be forgiveness I want to be inspiration I want to be creativity and that's up to me mm. it's not anybody else's responsibility and it's not anybody else's fault if I'm not being those things mm. I didn't always believe that but man when I changed the way I looked at things everything changed I mean my body's healed from all of that stuff not from any doctors yeah purely because I created an inner environment that was peaceful and loving and kind to myself then my body could breathe and yeah. and the systems that are designed to heal us were able to work because if you think about it when we are being unkind to ourselves and we're self bashing and we're feeling guilty and we're beating ourselves up. That takes a lot. That's again, like 
that analogy of shoving the ball down, but it takes so much energy. It takes so much a mental and emotional energy to do that, which pulls away from the energy our body needs to heal. And so when we're under stress and we're producing cortisol and adrenaline and whatever uh, other stress hormones, we're telling the brain that we're, we're in danger or something's wrong. So then our gut, our immune system stops because it takes so much energy. So that, that shuts down. Our frontal lobe stops working because we're using our rear brain fight or flight. So we're not thinking clearly. And then the third thing is, um, what is the third one? Uh, all, well, the gut, ha all the blood rushes to our limbs so we can defend ourselves. So it's, I can't remember what the third one, but there's, there's three main things that happen that are just not healthy for us. Mm. So when you start to realize that and you, you see how much power, the superpower of choosing who you want to be, how you want to respond. And I don't want to make it sound like this is some easy thing. Like tomorrow I'm just going to change everything. I'm never going to react again, and I'm just going to choose all these perfect responses. Sometimes you need help. I did. I needed help with medicine for 13 years. I'm off that, by the way. It's mm -hmm. going to be almost three years. On my own, I called, called my psychiatrist and said, I don't think I have bipolar. I said, I think I have an unregulated trauma response. And I've done all this work. I'm doing yoga. I'm doing breath work. I'm doing meditation. I'm doing healthy eating. I stopped drinking. I'm a gazillion other things. I said, can I try? Is it safe? He said, sure. Thank goodness. Like, yeah. I would have done it anyway, but I kind of wanted the blessing. And mm -hmm. I am the happiest and healthiest I've ever been. Wow. All because of the inner work. Mm. Truly. Mm. Do you think that the medicine helped you do the inner work in a more efficient way? 100%. Okay. That's why I would never, I, I don't have an opinion about medication one way or the other. I think, like again, it was a bridge for me, for sure. And then I didn't need that anymore. Some people may need it. And there's, the stigma has got to go because, you know, if these things are working for you, and you fe really feel like yourself and you feel healthy, so, so that's what it's doing, yeah. you know? I, I'm not an advocate or, or a you know, naysayer either way. It's like, again, listen to you. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard this about plant medicine in general, and this could probably be applied to a lot of SSRIs and any antidepressants. The medicine itself isn't actually healing you. Mm -hmm. It's giving you the opportunity to heal yourself right. by either dampening down your stress response, mm -hmm. dampening, you know, the flight or flight that you were talking about. It's allowing you to look internally and say, what do I need to work on? What can I do to make myself a little bit better, healthier, etc.?" And how can I, how can I continue to move forward? I think a lot of times when we don't have that medicine or when we're constantly just, you know, however you want to phrase it, stressed out or anxious all the time, we don't get the opportunity to really say, what do I need? Mm -hmm. Cause you're trying to focus on the external. You're trying to control the uncontrollables. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, you know, I, I think any of my experiences with plant medicine have been changing my perspective on my external world. And it really allows me to look deep inward. Absolutely. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I think those are, are necessary moments to, to move forward and continue to build yourself up to, uh, or even just search for yourself a little bit more. hundred percent. And I have done a lot of journeys with cannabis. So I haven't done any plant medicine beyond that, but the experiences that I've had just from that are are extraordinary. And I, I've i learned so much about myself and so much about the world and so much about the interactions of people. And so clarity because of being able, it takes you out of the 
inner workings enough so that you can like see i mean there's i believe there's the medicine in the cannabis that's giving you that gateway to have a different perspective and find ways of seeing yourself that you never would have maybe even contemplated otherwise because as einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same level of consciousness that created it so to me Mm -hmm. i'm getting out of the the everyday consciousness and i'm i'm elevating and i'm seeing solutions or different ways of doing things or perceiving things or responding to things so i take it very seriously i I don't use it as a recreation I, i use it as a sacred medicine for me I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, you know, myself and I think a lot of my other friends, you know, especially playing football, it was always one of those like, all right, you know, we'll, we'll smoke a little bit after practice, feel great and just chill out and relax. And it, it, it became a crutch mm-hmm. for a lot of us in our lives. And I, I know I've had a lot of conversations with my friends who have had issues and myself included where, we have to really question the intention behind our use. Mm-hmm. And I like what you said, instead of just constantly recreationally using it and not revering it for what it can yeah. really do, mm-hmm. almost not respecting it. Right. It it becomes this mask of mm-hmm. reality and we're not we're not tapping into ourselves more, we're escaping exactly. who we are. And I think as soon as I started to recognize that, oh, am I using this for an escape? I need to stop at this point and really, really question why I'm using, number one, and two, how can I use it in a safer direction moving forward? I think that goes for anything. Yeah, for sure. Tension really, I mean, it could be food. You know, if you, 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 it's how we do anything is how we do everything. I don't know whoever said that, but. I think it's true. It's very true. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah, I've had a coach. I've had, probably had multiple coaches say that to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, we talked about you being a wife and kind of going through marriage. Being a mother is obviously no easy task. Mm-hmm. And having three children from 23 to 27 makes it just that much harder. On top of everything you just talked about, mm-hmm. I would love to hear your experience through that some of the things that you either have had to battle and then also you know maybe we should touch on this first the amazing experiences that you had through motherhood yeah I mean it's such a gift to be a mother and I say and I get it's it's funny I get a lot of pushback with this sometimes but well people say you did an amazing job raising your kids I'm like, I'm not taking that credit. Like, yes, I I, I did love them to the best of my ability, but I feel that they have given me so much more than I could have ever dreamed of giving them. I think that sometimes I'll say they raised me, and I don't mean it like they had to be my parent, but, like, truly, I grew up because of my kids. Mm. Because, well, first of all, they are the biggest mirrors that you'll have because they're your kin. And so whatever isn't whole inside of you, that's going to that's gonna shine real bright <laughs> through your kids. And it's a gift. I may not have seen it like that yeah. at, at the beginning, but I'm a better human being because of my children. Because they helped me see the world different. They helped me understand myself clearly because um, not that they do pull my strings. That's a that's an illusion. But they did pull my strings, even if it's an illusion (laughs) (laughs) and helped me see where I needed to grow. Yeah. I'm forever grateful for that. And it's a privilege to be their mom and to see them unfold and evolve and become their own people I mean there there was a lot of struggle there was a lot because I wasn't a healthy person and for a long time I felt so much guilt and regret 
you know, I should have done this. I, why didn't I know that? And I, you know, I, why did I act that way? And I should have got help sooner and all, all the things. But I don't do that anymore because it's not loving. Life happens for us. So even my lack of awareness, my lack of emotional intelligence, my poor behaviors at times is going to serve them in some way because I can look at what I went through and if I can look at child abuse and say sexual abuse as a child and say that served me not everybody's going to get to that place but I truly embrace that because it's empowering mm. like I feel empowered almost I I'm to the point where I say I chose that and that's that's a step that may people may turn your podcast off but <laughs> I really believe that in my bones because it was my path to growth and the power in that is a freedom that I can't really put into words. So although I don't like the fact that I've hurt my children, no parent does, I'm not going to sit here and beat myself up forever over every little thing. I'm going to show them that the more empowering and loving thing to do is to forgive yourself because I want mm. them to forgive themselves because they're going to make mistakes too because right. we're not perfect. I mean, I'm never going to be perfect. And it's taken a long time for me to get to this place, but I want my kids to be healthy, happy, and whole more than anything. And they've helped me to become those things. And they've, they've inspired me to follow my passions um, and I've had to unlearn a lot from my own childhood, and they're going to have to unlearn a lot from, from me, but, but at least we can have these conversations right. now and be real and, and be honest with each other and apologize. And so, you know, I, I, I write poetry sometimes, and one of the poems I wrote about motherhood is just three lines, and it, I re think it really sums it up. It's uh, motherhood is like trying to hold on to water but being content with wet palms because they're not ours. They come through me and they're a privilege to nurture and love and raise, but they are their own sovereign beings. They have their own blueprint inside. They have their own true north. I'm not that. Mm. And that is also liberating because I felt like I had to be everything and I tried to be everything to the point of exhaustion you know I can't and I shouldn't because that then how do they learn to trust their inner strength and their intuition and their mm -hmm. you know so it's been a beautiful journey you know of, of, of learning these things and and being content with wet palms it's like Love sticks. I mean, the experience, the journey sticks. And that's what it'll be forever until it's not. Until it's not. <laughs> no, I, I love that you said that. And uh, the reason I, I wanted to touch on the good parts first is we, we I think personally, our gener my generation looks at motherhood or being a parent is almost a burden mm -hmm. as a another responsibility to think about and not to say it's not a responsibility mm -hmm. it's probably the biggest one in life mm -hmm. but it's this beautiful opportunity of love of learning yourself of overcoming challenges together of teaching another person how to live life correctly and we like I think we just overlook that aspect of it because we we focus so much on the negatives of the you know the first six months of having a baby it's it's crying a lot and it's mm -hmm. of course it is you know it's uh, these things aren't going to be perfect in your life but what thing in your life that's actually worth it didn't require hard work mm -hmm. or overcoming obstacles yeah. nothing 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 at all and mm -hmm. I love that you said you're able to have open conversations now and mm -hmm. and to really 
really learn from their trauma mm-hmm. and, and not only apologize to them for it, but also kind of apologize right. to yourself for holding that in. Right. Because I'm sure every parent internalizes their mistakes and really feels it deep down to their core Mm -hmm. and wishes they could do something different and it's a blessing for a kid to go through that though Mm -hmm. because like we were talking about earlier it's those hardships are are simply opportunities they're simply they're simply struggles that build you into the person you are Mm -hmm. And something I always wrestle with too is is being a future father is how do I integrate enough struggle in that child's life Mm -hmm. so they have the opportunity to grow? Because if I give them everything, they have everything they could possibly need. They never have to overcome things. They never have to learn. They never have to go through tough times where they they doubt themselves or anything like that. They're not going to become complete and not going to get the chance to really understand life as a whole and to feel that triumph of overcoming and to mm-hmm. feel that that just amazing feeling when you you push through something hard or you discover something new about yourself right. there's there's nothing like it in the world and I really don't want to do that to my children where I'm having a disservice to them by giving them such a mm-hmm. cushy life yeah you want them to have their own agency to, yeah. to figure things out mm-hmm. I really did try to be, like I said, I, it took me a while to turn the corner on that because I thought it was my job mm. to prevent every struggle and to be save the day and run in and do all the things. And that was my own insecurity. I needed to be needed to feel loved. And that was one of the biggest lessons for me. So if I wasn't actively needed, I didn't feel worthy or lovable and so again this goes back to I think the best gift you can give your children is to to work on yourself is to heal is to figure out what the stories are that you're believing that aren't true about yourself and that are really influencing how you see yourself in the world and how you see your children because we end up projecting that pain that we haven't dealt with on our kids not not consciously but it does happen Um, and then when you have that inner wholeness and that self-love and that self-respect you have the strength this goes back to this bandwidth to be able to sit with your child in their suffering not alleviate it not take the lesson away but sit with them but if you can't sit with yourself in your own suffering how are you going to sit with your kids Mm. and i couldn't do that for her i mean i'm just being very honest i couldn't do that for a long time because i didn't know how but i learned and again it's life is learning school especially parenting and if we remember that that we're here to learn we're here our kids are learning from us we're learning from them it's not um, it's not because I'm older and I've been there, done that, that I know better. That's kind of a, also a belief system. Well, I'm the parent. Just do it because I said so. Those words came out of my mouth a few times, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't even, that doesn't serve anybody because there's no understanding. There's no space for your child to express an opinion or a perspective they have perspectives Mm -hmm. and honestly my whole worldview has changed it in general because of hearing their perspectives because I was so caught in my own conditioning and my own programming and this is the way things were this is how I was raised this so this is the way no doesn't mean it's the way so it's very humbling but it's a gift if you love yourself enough to allow it to be a gift. Because mm. otherwise it can be pretty hard. Yeah. Because then you feel worse about yourself. Yeah. It's the mirror. It's the mirror. It's the mirror. And that, that first step is just loving yourself. Wow. That's uh, And I appreciate that quite a bit because, um, you know, I'm 26, just got married. We both have 
thoughts of, of having children one day and I think we're both in the understanding that we have we have a lot of work to do mm-hmm. before we do bring another child into this life and not to say you can't continue to do work right. when you do have that child right. um, but it, it's it's a process mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. to give that child a really good life you need to give yourself a good life first mm-hmm. yeah that's that's really powerful thank you Thank you for sharing. And, Thank you. Uh, um, there's there's one more thing I really wanted to get into before sure. we we hop off, if you don't mind, and that's around the topic of spirituality and faith. Mm-hmm. And I know when we were on the phone, we talked about kind of going back to the, the the motherhood aspect of it. Is you had a point when you were a mom and you had to challenge your your beliefs in. Um, is it Catholic, Christian, anything like that? So in that faith and now you kind of consider yourself more of a spiritual person and taking from mm-hmm. a bunch of different aspects. So I love to hear that process, number one, of how you challenged that faith and moved on from there. And then two, what does your spirituality look like now? Sure. Thank you for asking. So I didn't have a deep, um, everyday kind of a faith or spiritual practice as a child. Uh, We went to church sparingly, and I remember being confirmed in the eighth grade, but there was no relationship with God. I didn't pray. I didn't, I never thought about it. Mm. And I just, I know I wanted to be a good person, but I didn't have any kind of relationship to that. When I met John, uh, it's so funny because we met at Miami in college and he's like, do you want to go to church with me? I was like, there's a church here. <laughs> he's like, yeah, there's a church here. And so we went to the Catholic church and I was enamored with his faith. I, I, I just, the reverence and this love that he seemed to have. And I was like, what is that? I don't know what that is, but I want to some of that <laughs> yeah so long story short after we got married I became Catholic I went through the whole RCIA and we rose raised our three children in the Catholic faith and we we're very involved very involved in service t- tons of ministry tons of leadership we worked with the youth and life team we did Bible studies and all kinds of stuff so it was a really um, comforting kind of foundation and I didn't agree with a lot of things but I felt like at the time it was the right thing for our kids. And and then uh, Karen came out in 2014. And that container of the Catholic faith blew apart because there's no acceptance. There's actually, a, you know, admonishing of that. And I was like, this doesn't, these two things don't mix. Because I have my real life experience with my kid, who I love fiercely. I don't believe she's going to hell. This doesn't make any sense. And you want me to, like, turn my back on my own kid or tell her she's wrong or Mm -hmm. all these things. And my husband had grown up Catholic, so part of his whole life. This just threw everything up in the air. And so... um, I went on a real journey of questioning. And again, we can ask ourselves the stories that we believe about ourselves, but it also includes asking the stories we believe about life in general. And where did we get this belief? And who told us this? And is this even my belief? Do I even believe this is true? Is this serving me? Does this serve my family? Is this what's best for my children? Is this what's best for my marriage? Is this what's best for humanity? We start asking these things. and. We couldn't find any reconciliation in that faith tradition because we couldn't be a part of something that was going to reject our daughter. So we walked away. Um, And I'm past the, because it was such an emotional thing, I was pretty angry at the church back then. That was my own immaturity. I'm, I'm beyond that now where it's like I'm grateful for everything that we received from those years. I don't have any, you know, everyone 
chooses their path. There's no judgment. So I'm not angry. I'm grateful. But we've expanded. So now where? You know, what? what's next? And so I have a tendency to go really deep <laughs> on things and exhaust all avenues because I'm a curious person and I think that we learn so much from other people and other practices and other traditions and other beliefs because again there's 8 billion people who's right and that from 2014 through now has been a whirlwind of learning about spirituality from every aspect that I could get my hands on and, and experience and I started to see I, I was doing these journeys and I started to see a lot of indigenous um, imagery and I felt very drawn to that so I s learned all about indigenous Lakota and read Black Elk Speaks it was an amazing book and I built a medicine wheel in my property and I went and did a ceremony I, I had no idea about any of this stuff but I was so curious because it felt so expansive and like I felt so in a box in to say to put any label on anything it's almost like well now that's me and now I can't go outside that box mm. but we found that outside that box is a whole plethora of <laughs> experiences and beautiful ways of connecting with the divine which I just believe is in all things and I, th I mean, there's a million names for God, source, whatever, but I, I, I go with love. I think love is this energy that permeates all things. It's, it's, I think love is what we're made of. It's how we came to be, and we're held in it. Nothing, even the chair I'm sitting on has, I mean, quantum physics proves now. Everything's moving. Everything's alive. Every, there's nothing that's dead and material particle. It's all energy movement. And when you start to think that way and you start to ex and you start to learn from I learned a lot from the Buddhists and from Hinduism and Judaism and a little bit of Muslim like I just curious like these people have devoted their whole lives to this there's got to be something here mm. right so I, I just see that all these paths lead to the same end, and it's beautiful so for me my spirituality is I have a lot of still roots in Christianity but I, I I'm not a Christian but I love Yeshua as I call him now I don't even call him Jesus anymore because it's his real name was Yeshua and I'm like learning more like the story of him is so beyond what I was taught and I my meditation practice I this just came to me intuitively I started to be in a cave every time and it was a fire, and it was Yeshua across from me. And now there's like 30-some people in there. I call them my spiritual advisory board. Some, some family, some spirit animals, but a lot of like very spiritual people from all walks of faith that I feel guide me. And it feels so amazing because I don't feel trapped. I don't feel, I just feel like God is everywhere. And it's comforting, and it helps me. I, I'm a I'm a a more kind person in this space than I was because there was that natural judgment that comes because if you're not following this, then you must not have a right. I don't think that at all, and I think everyone should follow again the path that feels the best for them. Mm. There's no. How could you ever? put the right answer on something that big <laughs> you know it's like if you're kind and you're taking care of people and you're taking care of the earth and you're and you're trying to do your best and then whatever feels you know it's yeah. not a license to do whatever you want but it's it's a freedom to experience the divine yeah. the way you want yeah now, that was beautifully said. I really appreciate that and telling your story. You. And something I gained from it is the divine is in all things. Mm -hmm. And to and to be so arrogant ourselves as to think 
our perspective is the only way right. or our religion is the only way and not to open ourselves up and think a person across the world may be going through the exact same things I'm going through right. and find comfort in whatever they practice right. and whatever they believe in. And it seems that almost every religion has these commonalities between them. Mm -hmm. The things that you talked about, openness, love, mm -hmm. that energy, mm -hmm. giving back, serving, all these things permeate in all these religions. And, you know, I, at least for me, growing up, I definitely gained certain biases towards religions, specifically Islam, right? You know, I was born in 97, so mm -hmm. you had 9-11. This is actually a fitting conversation because right. it's 9-11 yeah. today. Right. Um, but you you had this demonization of this one religion based on extremists. And I, I just had a conversations with, with a lady in the sauna recently. And uh, she's a devout uh, Muslim who prays five times a day and I wanted to just ask, you know, what is the purpose of that? And it always seems so crazy to me, right? It's Ramadan, or you're, you're fasting all right. the time, or you're praying five times. It just seems like so much. And then she started to talk about it and what, what it did for her. Yes. And Direct experience. Yes. And, and it opened my mind to just think, oh, my gosh, this lady prays five times a day, and she has such a clear mind. She focuses on what's important. She's so grateful right. for her current situation, regardless of what's happening. And she's able to to navigate through life a little bit easier because this is not easy. No. What we do is not easy, especially in 2023. It's so many distractions, everything we just talked about, all those challenges. And to have something like faith or spirituality provides trust in us mm -hmm. that it's going to be okay and that we're not alone and all of this is connected and that that really resonated with me just hearing her experience and hearing even your experience about it and with with the native american cultures and how much that's impacted you on such a deeper level Deep. than just you know going to church and reading the bible yeah because it's all encompassing almost it's like I don't have to only do it this way and there were things that were part of that faith tradition that didn't really resonate with me and I, I felt guilty like I didn't like to pray the rosary I didn't it didn't it just didn't resonate mm. and I thought I'm a bad person because I'm not doing this but it's <laughs> so what it just didn't work for me yeah you know and you, you, you know your conversation with this lady is so profound because we just went to a Ramdas legacy retreat, my husband and I, and we were it was where bhakti meets Buddhism. So it was half uh, Hindu teachings and half Buddhist teaching, and there was a, a this first American Lama that was ever ordained in the Tibetan Buddhism, and these people that were trained and and spent time with um, Ramdas's guru Maharaji. Like we didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. We were open to it mm. and they were so open. It was like, it was a non-denominational five day retreat and we're doing all these, um, you know, kirtan is this chanting that you sing these, these mantras over and over again. We had no idea what we were saying. Some of them we had to say 108 times, but it was beautiful because it was like, wow, look at these people. Look at how inspired they are. And, and they're welcoming us into their practice. They don't care what our background is. I think that's so beautiful because why do we have to judge? There's, again, separation is a lie. It's an illusion. We truly are part of one energy and we are all uniquely expressed. But to feel that we're separate and to keep people out and and draw the line in the sand you can't come in these doors because you're this or that it just doesn't make sense to me yeah. because aren't we all in this together again united we stand divided we fall i mean it's 
we need to come together. We need to understand. We don't have to agree. We don't even have to understand. But can we respect? Can we respect each person's walk, whether that's a religious or spiritual walk, whether that's how they choose to raise their children, whether that's how they choose to t- take care of their body, what their politics are. I mean, it's all that is noise when we start fighting about it. And it doesn't push us forward. Is anybody happy doing that? That's what I get back to. It's like the love and logic. Are we happy in this system of way of being? Is it working? doesn't seem like it's working because there's a lot of discord. There's a lot of finger pointing. So Karin's journey, again, how your kids change you didn't see that coming yeah and man look at the world she opened me up to yeah and she's so grateful to have the support to have parents who were willing to take a hard look for my husband to walk away from his life of of a faith that he was a part of it's important yeah doesn't mean you have to but at least love your kid love your kid yeah simple as that love everybody you know yeah. Just love. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember talking with Karen on this podcast and she communicated to me how grateful she was too. Mm-hmm. And to feel that support during that time, it made it so much easier for her yeah. to go through that. And it's it's so inspiring to hear you putting aside your beliefs and being opening being open to a new way of thinking and I don't know if it's today's social media age or whatever it is it just feels like there's such a need to have that open discourse and to be okay with disagreement and a lot of times when we just sit down and give that person the opportunity to talk you start to recognize how much more in common you have with that person. Exactly. And you you think to yourself, oh, I've, if I was in that person's shoes, I'd probably act the exact same way. Right. And I think that applies to if not 100%, it's damn close to 100%. Yeah, because you're connecting at the soul level. Yeah. And you're seeing what's real instead of being distracted by all this illusion of labels and all the labels that we put on people. And I had a thought and I just lost it, but, oh, I know what I was going to say. Maybe it's a good way to end it about that, going back to that quote, lack of alignment with our deepest self is the most unrecognized stress on earth. Mm -hmm. When we don't know ourselves, and we're relying on the world around the external to tell us who we are. And it's not the truth. We're so unhappy. And, and we can't even find joy for the person who's thinking or believing different than us. But it's really not, it's a me problem. You know, that, that website that I created, Peaceful Change, it's, it, it starts with me. It doesn't start with you. It starts with me. If I want to have a different experience, I have to be the one to do that. And I, it starts with loving me. I have to believe that I'm good and I'm worthy because I exist, not because I earned it, not because someone tells me, but because it's just true. Yeah. And I think that kind of softens the edges around all this other stuff. If we're not happy within, that gets projected and and then we have to have the reasons I'm unhappy because you don't believe what I believe yeah yeah no it's a great way to wrap it up Shelby that was an amazing conversation Thank you. I really appreciate it so much I enjoyed it it was uh I'm excited to listen back and gain more wisdom and I hope everyone everyone listening gain wisdom um why don't you share your Instagram handle where they can find you online And then you mentioned the website you created. I think that's really powerful. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Thank you. I I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. Me too. At Shell Spear is pretty much, so Shell Spear 
for Facebook, Instagram. I'm, I don't have YouTube going just yet. I, I have it, but not with any content. Uh, mostly Instagram seems to be the more um, kind algorithm at the moment. <laughs> and I ha my website's shelbyspear.com for my mom stuff. That's going to be going uh, undergoing an overhaul here soon. And the peacefulchange.world is the site that I built to give back to the world the gift of everything that I've received in learning all of from all these amazing teachers, from the amazing podcasts and books I've read, the tools and practices I've implemented. It's an extensive toolbox on there that I recommend for anybody because I don't care who you are. There's some there's something of value in there and just look around, see what resonates with you because again there's no right answer that I could ever give. Um, you will you will find that within so I encourage everyone to check that toolbox out because mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health, all the movement stuff, I gotta put your stuff on there. Um, we need each other. So let's be there. Mm. Yeah. Let's, let's be there for each other. I love that. Well, Shelby, thank you once again. And thank you everybody for listening. Peace. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody wanna seem like they're living out the dream It's always about the green since we talk